Hi, I'm Reverend Greg and I welcome you to this video in the tutorial series Shaders for Hobby Programmers. In this video we'll improve the Bloom shader we created two videos ago. But as always a short disclaimer first. This tutorial series is mainly for hobby programmers who struggle with understanding shaders. I'm not a professional programmer and I'm not very good at maths, so if you see a mistake in my video or see a better way to solve a problem, please add a comment so everyone can learn from you. The last Bloom shader was just copying the brighter colors on the application surface to a second surface, blurred those bright colors and added them to the application surface colors so everything bright looks like it's glowing a bit. And this is what we'll create in this video. We'll be able to set the bloom uniforms like threshold, threshold range and intensity on a per layer or per depth range basis. Which means we can control how each layer is drawn to the luminance surface and thus get much more control over the bloom effect. The code in this video is building on the things we did in the Blur tutorials, the first Bloom tutorial and the GLSL ES to HLSL 11 tutorial. It will be quite overwhelming if you do not understand these videos, so I recommend to do those tutorials first. However, if you do not really follow the series and just want to see the general concept of blooming and multiple render targets, you will probably still understand that without watching all previous videos. To get this bloom per layer effect without losing too much performance, we need to learn about multiple render targets. Usually we draw like this. We draw a sprite or a surface onto a render target, which usually is another surface like the application surface. Multiple render targets means we can tell the shader to draw onto two render targets with one draw call. In example, we could draw the sprites normally to the application surface and grayscale to another surface to prepare some post-processing effect. And although in this video we will only use two render targets, you could actually add more than that if needed. According to the GML documentation you can set up four targets numbering from 0 to 3. I learned about multiple render targets through a tutorial on the GameMaker forums written by Binsk. I'll leave a link in the description of this video. So let me show how MRT is used in GameMaker Studio. This is an example code in GML in a draw event. Usually to set the render target we call the function surface set target and pass in a surface ID as the first argument. But to set multiple render targets all we need to do is set two surfaces with surface set target X. As first argument we'll pass in the target ID or number which goes from 0 to 3 and later inside the shader we'll refer to those IDs. And as a second argument we'll pass the surface ID, so in example the application surface or any other surface we created. That's all we need to set up in GML. GameMaker Studio handles the rest for us. Now this is a GLSL pass-through fragment shader as we know it already. It sets the color of the pixel on the render target by assigning a VEC4 color to GLFrag color. And this is a simple shader with two render targets. Instead of assigning one VEC4 color to GLFrag color, we can assign a VEC4 to GLFrag data 0 and another VEC4 to GLFrag data 1. And that's all. So drawing to multiple render targets is pretty simple. But here's the thing, rendering to multiple targets is not possible in GLSL ES. At least not before version 3 and GameMaker Studio as of now is using either GLSL ES 1 or 2. I'm assuming because GLSL ES 3 is not fully supported by all target platforms yet, but that's really just a guess. So this means we cannot use multiple render targets on Android, iOS or HTML. But we can use the code shown here as GLSL instead of GLSL ES code and run this on Linux or Mac OS. On Windows based platforms however we need to provide the shaders in HLSL. Now this is an HLSL pass through shader as shown and explained in the video from GLSL ES to HLSL 11. As in GLSL we need to pass an RGBA caller to the next stage in the GPU pipeline. Since we're passing nothing else than a float4 color, we don't need to create an output struct. We can just have the main function return a float4. The shader still needs to know where to draw. To do that, this pass-through shader sets up the render target in the main function's definition by setting its semantic to the reserved SV underlying target. But for multiple render targets, we need to pass on two colors, but the main function can't just return two float4. We can only return one thing. And that's why in this shader example there's an output struct called pixel shader output 
although you can name it as you want. And the only two members are two float four colors, which you can rename as well. To tell the shader where to draw these colors to, we need to use some reserved semantics though. SV underline target zero and SV underline target one. The main function's data type now is not float four anymore, but pixel shader output and the return value thus has to be of the data type pixel shader output as well. And all we need to do now is assign a vec4 color to both output struct members. Output.call1 and output.call2. So this looks a bit more complicated than in GLSL, but it should be pretty easy if you watch the video on GLSL ES and HLSL, or if you are a natural talent. But with multiple render targets explained, it's now time to show how we will use this feature to create the bloom by layer effect as promised. This was the drawing schematic in the first Bloom tutorial video. However, it has a small but important mistake. GM base texture for our Bloom blend shader is not the sprites we draw to the application surface. GM base texture is the application surface. So it should look like this. We drew the game to the application surface, then drew only the bright colors to the ping surface, did a two pass blur to Pong and back to ping, and then blended the blurred bright colors with the application surface by adding their colors to get the bloom effect. Most of this will stay the same. Actually, just the first part changes. As before, we're drawing the game to the application surface, but this time by an MRT shader instead of the default shader. The application surface will be render target zero. Render target one will be the ping surface. The MRT shader will draw just the bright colors to this render target. The shader will take three uniforms. The bloom threshold will determine how bright the color needs to be to be drawn to the pink surface. The bloom threshold range will soften up that threshold like it did in the first bloom video. And bloom intensity will draw those bright colors even brighter or darker. Now here's the important step. Since everything in the game is drawn by this shader and is drawn in the order of their depth, we can just change the threshold and intensity uniforms at specific depths, and everything being drawn after that will be drawn with those new settings. So we'll create a uniform setter object and place several instances at depths between the layers. If you're using GMS1, don't worry. The way we're going to do this won't really be based on GMS2 layers, but rather on depth. The code should be easy enough to translate to GMS1. Let me show a quick example though. Let's say we have a scene with four layers. A background layer for the sky at a depth of 400. A background layer for the town at a depth of 300. A tile layer for the main level at a depth of 200. And an asset layer for the foreground at a depth of 100. The shader will draw everything normally to render target zero, which is the application surface. Now we're adding uniform setter instances at a depth just before the layers. So an example at a depth of 401, we could add an instance setting an intensity of 0.5. This shader will then draw the sky layer darkened to render target one like this. Of course, we not only set intensity, but also threshold and threshold range, but I didn't want to make the image here more complicated than it already is. Then at the depth of uh, 301, just before the town is drawn, we could send new values to the uniforms. Here an example with double intensity and a high threshold and range, and the shader will now draw the town completely different to render target one. And at the depth of 201, we could just set the uniforms to 1 and the main level would be drawn normally to render target 1 as well. And finally, at the depth of 101, we could set the intensity to 0, which would draw the foreground completely black to render target 1. And this would be the result on render target 1. This would be our bloom luminance surface. Now back to the previous schematic. Once the bloom luminance is drawn to the pink surface, we proceed as before. We'll need to blur the pink surface horizontally to the pong surface, then vertically back to the pink surface, and finally we'll use pretty much the same shade as in the first bloom video to combine those two surfaces and draw the bloomed image to the screen. As you can see, really only the first part of this schematic is new. 
everything else we did before in the Blur and Bloom videos. Now it's time to create this example. I'd like to show this in a simple platformer game, and for this I already prepared a room created as a child from the template room in the base project. In the description of this video you'll find a link with the base project as usual, but this time also a project file with everything we created up to here, including the platformer level I prepared for this video. Let's have a quick look at what's here already. The lowest layer is an instance layer with just one object in it. Object Bloom MRT Background 2 Parallax. It has just a draw event that draws a background image from the base project tile to fill the view. Note the depth of this layer, it's set to 600. We'll need that later when creating a uniform setter object. The second lowest layer is pretty much the same. One object called Object Bloom MRT Background 1 Parallax. Again, with just a draw event to draw another background image from the base project tiles to fill the view. This time I use the extended function so I can darken the image a bit with the vertex color. And the depth of this layer is set to 500. Then there's two tile layers to show the main level. Again, all those assets are in the base project as well. And the depth of these layers are 400 and 300. Then the main instance layer. For now there's only collision objects in here. We're going to add a player and the shader test module later though. The depth of this layer is 200. And finally another tile layer for the foreground. I did not parallax this one though to keep it a bit simpler. And the depth of this topmost layer is 100. All these awesome assets were created by Luis Zuno and are available for free. I'll leave a link to Open Game Art and his Patreon page in the description of this video. And this is the GUI stuff. As you can see I prepared lots of sliders, added kill modifiers to remove the automation buttons of the sliders and squashed the text box a bit to fit all sliders in. The upper 5 sliders are for global controls and the smaller blocks beneath are for the layer controls. One for the instance layer background 2, one for the instance layer background 1, then for the tile layers, middle ground 1 and middle ground 2, then for the main instance layer and finally for the foreground tile layer. The creation order will be really really important here so we can adjust the correct sliders by code. Now let's just add a player object and test the mock-up game. Using the base project, that's easy. I'm just duplicating the object player template, rename it to object bloom MRT player, in create event we can remove the regions called information and shader. The region information is just that, there's no code in there. And the region shader is not needed because we're going to handle the shaders in the test module later. Inside the region set sprite and movement type, I'll just remove the examples that are deactivated anyways and use the standard character. But I'll set the jump speed from 6 to 8. This is setting up a simple low pixel character with a very simple platform style movement. And in the region set camera target and scale, I'll activate the code to let the camera follow the object and to zoom in by factor 3. That makes the camera object of the base project follow the player object and sets the zoom level to 3 times for a pixel artsy look. Now we can just place this player object on the main layer of the test room in the top left corner. Top left is important to show a problem with clipping later. Now just a quick run to check if the mockup is working. So we can see the different layers and the play object is working as intended. Now let's continue with the shaders. As in the first video on blooming we need three shaders for this. The bloom luminance shader to just draw bright colors on the bloom surface, then the blur shader to blur the bloom surface, and finally the blend shader to blend the application surface with the bloom surface. 
we already created the blending shader named Shader Bloom Blend in the first Bloom video. It was used to mix the application surface with the blurred Bloom surface. We can reuse this shader code, but it will run into a small problem and we'll need to fix that. So let's just duplicate Shader Bloom Blend and rename the copy to Shader Bloom Blend MRT for now. In the videos about blurring, we created a blur shader named Shader Blur 2 Pascal Slurp. It's the same we used in the first Bloom video as well, and again we can reuse it here as well. But again, we will need to make an adjustment later in this video, so let's duplicate this one as well. And name it Shader Blur 2 Pascal Slurp MRT. In the first video on blooming, we also created a shader named Shader Bloom Filter Luminance to draw the bright colors of the application surface to the pink surface. This is the shader we need to turn into an MRT shader now, where render target 0 will receive unchanged colors like in a pass through shader, and render target 1 will only receive the bright colors based on the threshold, threshold range, and intensity. So let's duplicate Shader Bloom Filter Luminance, rename it to Shader Bloom Filter Luminance MRT, and set the shader type to GLSL, since MRT won't work in GLSL, yes. Now the vertex shader still is just a pass-through shader, so we can close it. In the fragment shader, I'll rename the two already existing uniforms to make the names clearer. Bloom threshold becomes bloom layer threshold, and bloom threshold range becomes bloom layer threshold range. But now we'll also need a third uniform, bloom layer intensity. This will be a float as well, and we will use this uniform to determine how bright the layer's already bright colors should be drawn to the bloom surface. Inside the main function, we'll first need the color for render target 0. As mentioned before, that's just going to be a pass through code. So we still grab the base color, but then immediately after, we'll set GLFrag data 0 to the base color. Then the color for render target 1. First, we need to use the new uniform names. Then to get the intensity in, we'll just multiply base color RGB by the intensity factor. And finally, instead of setting GLFrag color, we'll need to set GLFrag data 1 to the base color. So GLFrag data 0 will go to render target 0 and GLFrag data 1 will go to render target 1. That's the GLSL shader for Ubuntu and macOS. Now we need to write the equivalent in HLSL 11 for Windows. So let's create a new shader, name it Shader Bloom HLSL MRT Luminance, and set the shader type to HLSL 11. Then we need to replace the GLSL ES path through code with HLSL 11 path through code. I'm using the same as in the last video, but I'll leave a link in the description of this video as well. This is the vertex path through. We won't need to change the vertex shader though, and can just close it. And this is the fragment pass through. We need to make it do the same as the GLSL shader we just finished. As shown in the introduction of this video, we'll now need to add an output struct because the main function will return two float fours instead of one. So I'll define the struct pixel shader output and add two float four members, base call and bloom call. The semantics have to be SV underline target 0 and 1, all in capital letters, so the shader knows which color goes to what render target. Don't forget to end the definition with a semicolon after the closing curly bracket. The uniforms we can just copy from the GLSL shader. Now we need to change the main function's definition. The return value will now be pixel shader output instead of float 4, and we defined the semantics in the struct already and can remove it here. Then we need to define the output variable. For render target 0, we can then just set output.baseCall to baseCall. And for render target 1, I'll just copy the code from GLSL and make changes where needed. In the float loom line, we need to change rec 3 to float 3. The float weight line can stay as it is. The mixing line, however, needs some minor changes. The mix function is called lerp in HLSL and the back 3 of zeros needs to be written as 
0.0f for float dot xxx as already learned in the video from GLSL ES to HLSL 11. Now to set the color of render target 1, we can just set output dot bloom call to base call. And now returning output will return the two members output base call to target 0 and output bloom call to target 1. But when I ran this in the mid of my recording session, I noticed some mistakes I made. First I realized I wrote the uniform shaders wrong in both HLSL and GLSL. So let me quickly fix that. And then I noticed I wanted to name the GLSL shader differently. So I'm going to rename it to Shader Bloom GLSL MRT Luminance. Pretty much the same as the HLSL shader. And that's it about the shaders. So let's move on to the trickier part, the object. We will reuse some code from the object we created in the first video about blooming. So let's just duplicate the object, Object Bloom AppSurf, name it Object Bloom MRT, and place that object anywhere on the main instance layer of our test tube. In Create Event, I'll just change the info text. And we can safely remove the mockup region since we created a mockup game with the layers in our test room. Now, here's what I like to do I'd like to make this object behave differently based on what shaders are being compiled, and to control this, I'll add a new variable called shader type to the top of the sprite and shader region. Then we can check if shaders are supported, and if so, check if Shader Bloom HLSL MRT Luminance is compiled, and set shader type to 3. This should be true on Windows based platforms, but if not, we check if Shader Bloom GLSL MRT Luminance is compiled, and set shader type to 2. This should be true for Ubuntu and macOS. And if not, we finally check if the shader from the first Bloom video is compiled, Shader Bloom Filter Luminance, and set shader type to 1. But for testing purposes, I'll just set shader type to 0 again in the end, to simulate that no shader is compiled for now. We'll remove that line later. Now we need a switch block to set up the Bloom Luminance shaders and uniform handles depending on the shader being compiled. Just as a reminder, the luminance shaders are the ones that check for the luminance threshold and only draw the bright colors onto the bloom surface. Case 1 will be for GLSL ES. This code is here already, so I'll just cut and paste it into case 1 and add a break. Case 2 is for the native GLSL shader, Shader Bloom GLSL MRT luminance we created earlier. This shader takes three uniforms, layer intensity, layer threshold, and layer range. And case 3 is for HLSL 11. And apart from the shader name, is the same as the GLSL case. So I'll just copy paste that code and change the shader name. Now the rest of the code in this region can stay pretty much the same, but we only need to run it if shader type is 1 or higher. Of course you could also say if it's not 0. Now we still need the blur shader. But this time it's called Shader Blur 2 Pass Gauss Lerp MRT. We still need the uniform handles for the blur steps to set the size of the blur effect, the blur vector to set horizontal or vertical blur, the texel size to tell the shader where to take samples from, and the Gaussian sigma to determine the Gaussian blur bell shape. And we still need the blending shader, but it's called Shader Bloom Blend MRT now. The uniforms and handles will stay the same as well. 
Bloom intensity will be a global setting now, whereas bloom layer intensity in the luminance shader we set up earlier will be on a per layer basis. Bloom darken will darken the application surface and bloom saturation will saturate the bloom surface. And bloom texture will be needed to get the bloom surface into the blending shader. We also still need the dimensions of the GUI layer, the application surface and the texel on the application surface. We still need the ping pong surfaces for the blur shader and we still want to disable the automatic drawing of the application surface since we're going to do that with the blending shader. In the GUI region all I want to do for now is delete everything in it. We'll need to rewrite that in a sec. Let's have a look at the other events then. First a cleanup event. And the only change we need to make here is to exit this event if no shader was compiled. Because then we won't have declared the ping pong surfaces and would get an error. Then the step event. All we need and actually should have done in the previous bloom object is overriding the parent step event because we simply don't need it. So let's just add an empty step event. And in draw GUI begin event, we can for now just exit as well if no shader was compiled. So let's run this again to see how it looks without a shader and to see if it's the same as before. So you can see to the right are all our sliders enumerated in the order of their creation. Now let's set up those sliders in the create events GUI region. First we need two local variables. Slider will be used as a counter and slider max will be the number of sliders on the GUI. It's three sliders per layer for intensity, threshold and range and six layers. So that's 18 sliders for the layers. Then it's another five sliders on the top for the global settings. That's 23 sliders altogether. Next I'll initialize the sliders to have no caption and a slightly larger button. and in the end reset the counter back to zero. Now we need different slider captions and values for GLSL ES and for native GLSL and HLSL. The GLSL ES first, so if shader type equals one, we want to set the global sliders only. That's the sliders for the blur steps, blur sigma, the intensity, the darkening of the application surface, the saturation of the bloom surface, the bloom threshold, and the threshold range. And as slider values, I just set something I found works quite nicely with the mock-up game. The slider values go from 0 to 1, and from that we'll calculate the values passed to the uniforms in the draw events. Then the slide is for native GLSL and for HLSL. Here we also need intensity, threshold and threshold range per layer. First the global slider captions. Now the layer slider captions. Then the global slider values. And finally the layer slider values. Now let's get the GLSL ES version running. That's without MRT and would run on pretty much any platform. So it's basically what we had at the end of the first Bloom video. Let's start by setting the shader type in create event to 1. Then we need to change the draw GUI begin event a little bit. First, in the set values section, I'll bring the local vars into the same order as I set the sliders in create event. So basically just moving threshold and range to the bottom of the list. Then we need to fix the slider numbers. From top to bottom, that sliders 0 to 6. And finally, we'll only need the global threshold and range in GLSL ES, so shader type 1, because in GLSL and HLSL, that's a per layer setting. 
So let's wrap that into an if statement. And the last thing we need to change is the first pass where we use to draw the bright colors to the application surface. This as well should only run in GLSL ES, but not in GLSL or HLSL. And that's it for GLSL ES. Now the effect should look the same as at the end of the first Bloom video. So let's run this. As you can see, the sliders are now named and working. We can set the blur size and sigma the bloom intensity, the application surface darkness, and bloom saturation, as well as the bloom threshold and threshold range. Now it's time to implement the GLSL and HLSL versions with multiple render targets. First in the create event we can now remove the temporary shader type equals one line. We'll now let the compile checks take over. Next we need to make sure that everything of the game, every layer is drawn through the MRT shader. So we need to set it up before anything gets drawn. For that let's create a pre-draw event and then set the shader if shader type is 2 or higher. And finally, we'll need to set up both render targets. Target 0 is the application surface, and target 1 the ping surface. Now this would throw an error since ping surface doesn't exist yet. So far we created the ping pong surfaces in draw GUI begin event, so let's cut and paste them from there to the pre-draw event and wrap that code in an if statement checking for shader type 1 or higher since we won't need the surfaces if no shader was compiled. There's a few mistakes still in here but we're going to fix them after I've shown what's going wrong with this code though. Next we'll have to reset the shader after everything is drawn. So let's create a post draw event to reset the shader and the render target if shader type is 2 or higher. So GLSL or HLSL. Now this will work already, but all uniforms for the bloom luminance shader would be zero still. We'll need to pass in the uniforms before every layer. So let's create a new object and name it Object Bloom MRT Uniform Setter. This object only needs a draw event to set the three uniforms for the Luminance MRT shader and I'll use a script to create instances of this object from within the create event of our test module object. I think the easiest way to show this is by starting with this script. So let's also create a new script and call it create bloom MRT uniform setter. This script will need a layer name and a slider number. The layer name is going to be the name of the layer we want to set the uniforms for. If you're using TMS1, you'd probably pass in the depth at which you want to pass in the uniforms. And the slider number will be the first of three sliders used to manipulate the three uniforms. Now we'll need to get the depth of the layer. And then create an instance of the setter object just before that layer. So its depth will be one more than the layer's depth. Now this setter instance needs to know the instance ID of the instance with the uniform handles. So I'll store the ID of the calling instance in a variable of the setter instance called parent. And the setter instance also needs to know what slider it should check to set the uniforms. So I'll store argument 1 in a variable of the setter instance called slider. Now we can call this set to creation script from the create event of our test module. I'll create a new region for that. And call it uniform setters. 
Inside this region we'll check for the shader type again because we only need those setters in GLSL or HLSL but not in GLSL yes. And then we'll create one setter per layer in the game. The instance layer background 2 will be set to slider number 5. Sliders 0 to 4 are already reserved for the global bloom settings, like blur size and sigma. This means, as we will see in a minute, the setter object will take values of slider 5 and the following 2, so 6 and 7, to set the uniforms just before layer background 2 is drawn. That's why the setter for the instance layer background 1 gets a slider number 8, It'll use that and 9 and 10 to set the uniforms for background 1. And then middle ground 1 will get sliders 11, 12, 13. Middle ground 2 will get sliders 14, 15, 16. The main layer will get the sliders 17 to 19. And the foreground layer the sliders 20 to 22. Now to the draw event of the setter object. We'll just set the uniforms using the parent's uniform handles and the slider values. It's pretty simple. The parent was set to the instance ID of the test module by the script we just wrote, and slider was the numbers we just set using this script. In a test between recordings, I noticed another small mistake I need to fix. I wanted the standard intensity of layer BG2 to be 1 and not 0.1. Now this should be it, in theory. Time to run and fix some problems. First on Windows. So this works, all sliders are named correctly and the layers react accordingly. If we move the global sliders, darken and intensity all the way to the left, we can see the render target zero, the application surface. And if we move both to the right, we can see the blurred bloom surface. Note how high I've set sigma this time. It starts to look blocky, but if we move the darken slider back to the left, to bring in the application surface again, you won't notice the blockiness anymore. But anyways, the HLSL part works. Now it's time to run this on Ubuntu. And this is weird. I see no bloom effect at all. If we move the global sliders darken and intensity all the way to the left, we can see the render target zero, the application surface, and everything looks as it should. But if we move both to the right, we can see the blurred bloom surface stayed black. Nothing was drawn to it. For some reason, setting render target 1 didn't work at all. But this gave me quite some headache and I got to admit, I don't at all understand the solution I found. I think that's kind of scary when working on a project, but let's just do some mysterious changes to make this shader work as intended. The first thing is changing the pre-draw event to draw begin. Now let's run this in debug mode on Windows. And now the game is black. But if we pause the runner and check the surfaces, we can see the ping and pong surfaces are actually there and the application surface stays cleared. And the same happens on Ubuntu by the way. So I guess that's not a bug, but just lack of knowledge on my part. The next step of the solution is not setting the application surface. My thinking was this. If GameMaker Studio is setting the application surface to render target zero after the pre-draw event, I might not need to do that by code and might mess up something. So let's just comment out that line and run this again on Windows. And now it works again. 
If we move the intensity and darken sliders to the left, we can see the application surface. And if we move them to the right, we can see the bloom surface. But what on Ubuntu? Let's run it there as well to see if that problem of the bloom surface staying black is fixed now. So this looks better already. If we move the intensity and darken sliders to the left again, we can see the application surface is there. And if we move the sliders to the right, we can see the bloom surface is there as well, but it's not blurred. So I guess setting the render targets is working now, but there's something wrong with the blur shader. So let's open the shader called Shader Blur 2 Pascal Slurp MRT. Now this was really tough for me to debug, but the solution is simple again. Apparently we can't use precision qualifiers in native GLSR. So let's just remove the qualifier high P in front of VEC4 blur call. We don't really need it anyways. In the blur tutorial, we just added this qualifier because we got precision problems when blurring with many blur steps. And that won't be an issue with the performance improvements we made since then. By the way, if you ever need to set the precision for a native GLSL shader, you could use precision statements instead of precision qualifiers like in GLSL ES. I will leave a link in the description of this video. Now we can run this on Ubuntu again and see the shaders finally all working. But is it really working? So far all the pixels of all sprites and tiles used in this video are either alpha 0 or alpha 1. Nothing in between. What happens if we add something with transparency though? So let's just create a new object called Object Bloom MRT Test Transparent. And assign a sprite with transparency to it. I'll just pick Sprite Glow Square from the base project for that. Now we can place this new object on the instance layer BG1, close to the play object. And run this again. At first everything looks kinda okay, but it's not. The transparency of that sprite is punching a hole in our surfaces. We can see that more clearly when moving the intensity and darken sliders to the right to show the bloom surface. Now we can see that the area around this object is not covering the application surface properly and thus the blur won't show correctly. But that just means we need to adapt the blend shader and the blur shader a tiny bit. So let's start with the blur shader. Now since our bloom surface will be completely opaque anyways, we can just remove the alpha from the blur completely and replace it with alpha 1 at the end. To do that we need to make the variable blurred call a vec3. Just get the color without the alpha from all three texture 2D functions by adding .rtb. And in the end create a vec4 from blurred call divided by total white and alpha 1. Then the blend shader. Let's open Shader Bloom Blend MRT. Here we can see we already ignored alpha from the bloom surface and we just need to do the same for the application surface. So let's make base call evec 3 as well and just grab RGB from the sample. Then in the line where we add the colors together we can remove the dot RGBs from base call since it's evec 3 now anyways. And finally, in the GL frag caller line, we now need to construct a VEC4 from the VEC3 base call and 1. Now we can run this again, Windows first. This looks right and if we move the intensity and darken sliders to the right, we can see the bloom surface is now properly blurred, even where the transparency of the glowing sprite is. So let's run this on Ubuntu as well. And this looks right too and moving the sliders to the right shows it is working correctly now. Ignore the low FPS though. My Ubuntu testing machine is a 11 or 12 year old laptop with no dedicated GPU handling blur, MRT and video recording at the same time. 
Without the recording software, it runs at steady 60 FPS despite its age. Now before ending this video I'd like to show another mistake I made while creating the shader for this tutorial and it's rather simple to reproduce. First let's set target 0 again in draw begin event. Then we need to change the post draw event to draw end event and run this. This looks a little bit off right from the start. But if we move around you can see by how much. Apparently the camera is still following the object, but there's some kind of clipping issue. The only reason I wanted to show this is, in case you run into a problem like that, think about checking the events used, or maybe learning about custom cameras and not using the application surface at all might help as well. The same situation occurs on Ubuntu by the way, there's no difference. But now, let me revert these changes. I know this might have been a bit of a complicated and overly long video, but I hope it helped a lot anyways, despite me not being able to explain everything. If however you got some explanations to offer, I'd love to read them, so please leave a comment below this video. I guess I'm done with blurring based videos now. I think it was a great topic to learn lots of new stuff and I hope you enjoyed this series so far. Next time I'm going to continue with a new topic, most likely finally Luma masks from simple to more complicated. But as always, not 100% uh, sure yet. Until next time.